The tall Norwegian captain of this vessel was Roald Amundsen. He had spent years reading about the failed attempts to find a route through the frozen waters and believed that he knew how to succeed where others had failed. On the 19th of May 1845, Sir John Franklin, an experienced 59-year-old Arctic explorer, set sail from Greenhive, England. Under his command was the 19th British Expedition, attempting to traverse the fabled Northwest Passage, seeking a shorter route to Asia. Franklin was leading two modified warships, the HMS Erebus and the HMS Terror, on what would ultimately become the greatest disaster in 300 years of British exploration. Furnished with the finest tools, technology and equipment that Victorian England had to offer, the two vessels, weighing more than 350 tons each, were adapted in the hopes of dominating their environment when they reached the frigid Arctic climate. The bows of the vessels were up to eight feet thick and clad in iron as they anticipated plowing through the pack ice, navigating uncharted waters. A library of more than 1,000 books an organ, and hearty meals of canned foods, a first for any expedition, were stowed on board to keep the men in good health and upbeat spirits. There was an extraordinary confidence in the power and might of these industrial age floating fortresses, which is why the Royal Navy was in utter shock when it received reports that all men had died on the expedition. Through cold exposure, lead poisoning, perhaps from their canned food, and scurvy, the crew had fallen into disarray after the death of Sir John Franklin, who died 10 months after the vessels became trapped in pack ice off the coast of King William Island. It has been more than 170 years since Franklin and his men were lost, and only now are we finding out the full story of the tragic outcome of their failed expedition. The wrecks of the Erebus and Terror were discovered fairly recently. Canadian scientists have also conducted extensive tests on the well-preserved bodies of the sailors found on King William Island. At the end, it appears that some resorted to cannibalism as there seemed no escape from the barren landscape or frigid icy prisons that their vessels have become. Others attempted to walk south, and except for meeting a couple of Inuit hunters who shared their rations, they were never seen again. Almost 60 years after Franklin's expedition, in the summer of 1903, a small 45-ton fishing vessel named the Yoa, pronounced Joa in North America, set sail from Oslo under the midnight sun in another attempt to finally traverse the Northwest Passage. The tall Norwegian captain of this vessel was Roald Amundsen. He had spent years reading about the failed attempts to find a route through the frozen waters and believed that he knew how to succeed where others had failed. Amundsen realized that the hostile climate of the Arctic could not be conquered by rigid power and might. Rather, one would need to be flexible and adapt to the severe conditions in order to successfully traverse the frozen landscape. The Joa was not built to push through ice flows, but instead, with its shallow draft and small frame, could sail through channels that would be impassable for larger vessels. Following the same route as Franklin's expedition, Amundsen chose to sail south from Beachy Island down the Peel Sound. Arctic pack ice sometimes leaves a narrow and often shallow channel when it meets the relatively warmer coastline. It is through these narrow leads that Amundsen's shallow draft fishing vessel was able to avoid the same fate as Franklin's expedition, which became trapped in a compounding pack ice. Sailing around the eastern side of King William Island, Amundsen and his crew found a small natural harbour that was safe enough for the Joa to be moored through winter. This place is known today as Joa Haven and a small community of just over a thousand Inuit lives there. It was the Inuit who taught Amundsen how to survive in this cold, harsh climate. Though the Inuit had been considered little more than uneducated savages by the British explorers, Amundsen instead spent his time trying to learn everything he could from them, recognizing that they clearly held the knowledge about survival in the Arctic. Swapping wool clothing for animal skin undergarments and caribou fur, he learned how to build an igloo and how to hunt and fish in the bleak and desolate landscape. 
One of the most important skills he learned here was how to travel overland with sled dogs. In 1911, this skill would enable him to become the first man to reach the South Pole, arriving there five weeks before Robert Falcon Scott's ill-fated expedition. After spending two winters with the Inuit at Joa Haven, Amundsen once again set sail with his crew, maneuvering through narrow, shallow channels, sometimes through water only three feet deep. Franklin and his modified warships would never have succeeded in navigating such challenging waterways. Eventually, on August 26, 1905, the crew spotted another vessel, an American whaling ship from San Francisco. Thus, the Northwest Passage had finally been traversed. By comparing the strategy of Franklin's failed expedition to that of Amundsen's successful endeavor, we're able to learn a valuable lesson. We can often, even unconsciously, put too much faith and confidence in advances of science and technology, the grandeur of design and human innovation, or the impressive achievements of corporations and institutions in society around us. Franklin and his men were confident that the material provisions and advanced technology with which they had surrounded themselves would be sufficient to cope with whatever nature could throw at them. By contrast, Amundsen was able to carefully navigate a much smaller vessel through the treacherous waters of the Arctic in an almost David and Goliath comparison to Franklin. The men of Franklin's expedition perceived that the inhabitants of the frozen region were savages, and yet it was the Inuit who held the keys to survival in such a harsh environment. We have a subscriber from our program who just so happens to live in Joa Haven. Hello. Hey Adam, how you doing? I'm all right. I wanted to ask you, what what was it like growing up in Joa Haven? Well, the first answer I can give you was pretty cold. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but it was, it was okay. We coped with the isolation and living up north for so long, the cold becomes kind of, kind of fun. We get to play out in the snow and everything growing up. Is it normal to ever travel to Terra Bay or does that not normally happen? Um, I don't travel there, but I'm not sure if anyone does. We normally go hunting and fishing on certain campgrounds. I've never heard anything of anyone going to Terra Bay. The expedition with Franklin and the one uh, with, with Amundsen, they left their boats in the ocean and they were just trapped. It used to stay frozen until first, second week of July, but lately it's been free, it's been frozen maybe third week, a little longer. During the summer events, it begins to melt rapidly. Right. And um, it breaks apart pretty fast. Uh, obviously, being so far north, do you, even to this day, do you still feel isolated from the rest of the world? Um, in some ways, we feel, as a community, we all know one another so well. So we are connected together. But isolated apart from the world, yeah, we've had a, a huge sense of that. So Amundsen succeeded where Franklin had failed, and it was the Inuit and his simple approach that led to his success. Instead of having confidence in material possessions, we should follow Amundsen's approach of humility and a childlike method of learning and apply it in our lives too. Subscribe and click the notification bell to receive updates about new content. Visit tomorrowsworld.org for more articles, telecasts and booklets.